Ε, καλησπέρα και πάλι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, φίλες και φίλοι. Τώρα έχουμε την τρίτη μας διακεκριμένη διάλεξη από τον γνωστό σε όλους πλέον καθηγητή Τζο Κίσλο. Πολύ φίλος της, της Ελλάδος και φίλος δικός μας. Ε, μας υποστηρίζει συνέχεια από την αρχή του, αυτού του συνεδρίου και όλοι μας ε, περιμένουμε τον ακούσουμε τα τελευταία δεδομένα στην ε, τεχνική νοημοσύνη, τι έχει να μας πει. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, it's a great pleasure to see Joe uh, Kislo again uh, from uh, quite far away. Uh, but uh, what time is it there, Joe, now? It's uh, just after 11 in the morning. Oh, nearly lunchtime. Great. Great. Well, time. I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> It is, uh, it's great to see you, Joe. Uh, and uh, hopefully next year you will be live uh, in, uh, in Greece, uh, hopefully. I guess you are well vaccinated and very safe. You look uh, uh, very healthy and bright. As uh, always, you haven't changed a bit <laughs> from uh, last time I saw you. Uh, your talk uh, will be on uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, almost a daily topic everywhere. Wherever we go, it is all about artificial intelligence. Is it really uh, here with us to change our life and how is going to change our life as Echocardiographers, but also importantly as cardiologists. So George Athanasopoulos and myself are great, uh, deeply uh, grateful uh, to you to um, be with us uh, once more. George? So it's more than a pleasure. It's, uh, it's something which is for us very encouraging uh, from the educational point of view to have your precious input Uh, on this issue. Looking forward. Well, thank you, George. Thank you, Petros. Uh, it's good to see you. I, uh, I'm always amazed at this technology where we can see and talk to one another. And yes, I'd rather do this from Athens than here. But uh, being the case, let's see if what we can do with this very difficult topic, because the very difficult topic is artificial intelligence. And so Let me uh, share this, which I think you should have. Do you have it? Not yet. Now it's coming. Yes. Good. Thank you. Well, artificial intelligence in cardiovascular imaging, that's the topic. And the role of the echocardiographer is another. And that is how do we interact with it? But, you know, we interact with it every day. Uh, earlier today, I asked uh, my telephone what time it was in Athens, just to make sure I was on time. And then I looked at your weather, and I looked at all kinds of things. So we're in the middle of artificial intelligence, and the role of the echocardiography, uh, the echocardiographer. Well, I think we all can agree that's evolving. Now I have some older slides here, and I like to look back in time. And I like to look back at my skeptical attitude, what it was like way back when, when I had such a bad attitude about everything. I doubted everything. But uh, again, I'd like to tell you that I've changed and things are new. And this idea of our skepticism and what we have to do and how we are involved with the image is still in evolution over this time. I must say, uh, I don't look like a very happy person, but then again, I know I passed it on in my genes, but he here's my granddaughter, Lily. Christmas time, my word, how would you like to deal with that? But look at the content. There's something very happy going on here, and that's Christmas. And at the same time, we've got this little girl who is obviously trying to be in control. So who's in control here? Is it you as represented by my little granddaughter here? Or is it the event? Is it Christmas that's going to do it for us? Well, there are monsters out there. So let's discuss some of them. And in the beginning here, and some of you are familiar with this book, this is Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are. 
showing the monsters and how all these things can affect us. Well, it also can be very complex. Let's go back in time, back to the 17th century to Gottfried Leibniz. is a German philosopher, mathematician. He invented a calculator. Here's his calculator, not the only calculator, but he, he invented one. But he's more famous for the idea that the mind is just a machine. And this machine can be duplicated like a calculator can be duplicated. Now, he didn't have the tools back then in the 17th century, but in fact, you see the idea. He died at the age of 70. Well, that kind of sat there evolving slowly, but it was really during early parts of World War II where it really took off with Alan Turing. Here, the English mathematician, some of you may remember him from the 2014 movie, The Imitation Game. And he worked at Bletchley Park and encountered in 1939 the German code system of Enigma. And of course, he invented what's deemed to be the first computer with Bamba to figure this out and to figure out how this Enigma worked. And that's the picture of the first of the first computer down on the lower right. It's still a usable item, although it's a replica. You can visit it at Bletchley Park. 1950, though, he developed the Turing, uh, the Turing test. And what that is, imagine you are the observer C here, and you are able to talk to two sources. A is a computer, B is a person. But you don't know the, who's behind the scenes. And you ask questions, and then you get answers back. And then the test is, can you as a person here as C, Determine whether the answers to the questions are coming from a machine, A, or a human, B. And if you can pass that test, in other words, if the computer can be as good as the human and the observer can't tell the difference between the two, then that's a successful Turing test. Well, it languished a bit, but after World War II, computers boomed. John McCarthy, it was the inventor of the term uh, artificial intelligence, or a leader of a group that did it. He was a computer scientist at Dartmouth. At the age of 29, he originated the term artificial intelligence in 1956 at a grand Dartmouth conference, probably of eight or nine of the greatest thinkers in the world. He then moved from uh, Dartmouth, 1956, to MIT, eventually at Stanford. I think the interesting thing is he was a communist and an atheist. And, and once he encountered all the computer things, he later became a Republican, which in our politics is a very unusual combination. This is an article that he produced and it's not published in the literature. It's only in PDF form, but published at the reference at the lower right. And I encourage you to go to look at that article if you can. But here he defined things, answered questions, did all sorts of things. And he described artificial intelligence as the science of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. But he had a foil. John Cyril had the concept of intentionality, very complex concept. He was a philosopher, again, in California, at the University of California, Berkeley. And in 1983, he had the famous paper about intentionality. He said that machines cannot have beliefs or ideas because they are not conscious. And he developed the concept of the Chinese room, which we'll see in a minute. I think it's also interesting here in 2019. Look, he must have been age 87. He was fired from his job for sexual assault. Uh, the, the, I don't know these people. But the concept of the Chinese room is another test like the Turing test. You put Chinese characters in one side of the room and then into the room is a person, or in this case could be a computer, and out of it comes the words in English. And if it passes the Turing test, that's strong artificial intelligence, but it here in the Chinese room doesn't mean that the computer actually understands what's going on. 
but the computer just d- does its job, whatever it's programmed to do, but it doesn't think. All these concepts are so, so difficult to understand. Now it's a little bit easier. We're going to go back in time again, but not very far back to some more simple concepts to demonstrate this. Some of you remember this movie actually in 1968, 53 years ago, a long time. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And in this case, there were characters involved, only three. Dave, who's going to be sitting in this space station. And Hal, the computer who controls everything. And Frank. Frank is out here in the remote vehicle. And Dave wants to open the bay doors and allow Frank into the space station. Hal is the computer, heuristically programmed, algorithmic computer. What this means is it learns. So here, let's listen to their conversation a short bit. You'll hear Dave trying to talk to Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Who are you reading, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Hal refuses. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. So where is this going? Dave says to Hal, open the bay doors. And he says, no, no, the computer says. And he knew that Frank and Dave were going to disconnect him. So now the computer is talking back and controlling everything. It's frightening. And the other thing is this artificial intelligence, it learns. Learning is an incredible concept here. And that someday computers will control us. Yes, echocardiographers. It and other imaging people, it these computers will make a diagnosis. They will control us. And we need to then argue back with them to straighten out what artificial intelligence really means. Well, then concepts develop for every day. 1977, 44 years ago, Star Wars. This is when Petros George took their children to watch Star Wars. And in fact, we had these two characters, RT. D2 and C3PO. And here they are lost on the planet Tatooine. But listen to them. R2D2, by the way, stands for Real 2 Dialogue Track 2. That's where the film was. And C3PO is arguable what that stands for, but that's custom third party object. Let's listen to them on the planet Tatooine and see what their artificial intelligence is. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. I've got to rest before I fall apart. My joints are almost frozen. What a desolate place this is. His joints hurt. He's complaining. How human can that be? So now the computers become human-like and to suffer, the desolation, the innocence of these two characters and R2-D2 talking in some sort of language. But C-3PO understands R2-D2. It's humorous. These concepts have been around for a long time and it requires new definitions of artificial intelligence. So if you ask Google, and say, what is artificial intelligence? You get this. Look at the words below. The summary is the computer tasks that normally require human intelligence. That's a loose definition of what this is. But it requires human intelligence, and it implies that computers can do it. 
So let's just look at a simple example. Here we have Google Translate 15 years ago where it's doing some tasks for us. Let's watch what this does. You know, when you type in the title of the talk, there it is. Here it comes in Spanish. We go to it and say, I don't want it in Spanish. Here's Greek. I don't know how, I don't know how accurate that is. You'll have to tell me. But to me, it's very helpful. So now we have the interpreter, this person interpreting the information, saying it's helpful to me, but in Greek, it may not be helpful to you. Let's look at other difficulties here, a further definition. This one gets really deep. And it's called transhumanism. This concept that the human race can evolve beyond what we currently are, currently beyond our physical and mental uh, uh, the limitations, especially by means of science and technology. That's computers. That's artificial intelligence. That's the concept of transhumanism. That's where we're going. We're going, but it's more frightening. Let's take a look at what Echo has encountered. The excitement, of course, has recently been about Caption Health. And they're a little device which takes an inexperienced individual and then gives them a transducer in their hand and tells them what to do. Let's take a look at that, especially since our Food and Drug Administration allowed this and authorizes the marketing of the first cardiac ultrasound software that uses artificial intelligence to guide someone. This is one year ago, it's been released. And you get on the screen a matrix that looks like a human body, and it tells you to put the transducer here and angle in whatever direction it tells you. And you get a screen that looks something like this. On the left is this bar that goes up and down and says, whether it's a good image or not, and it tells you what to do. On the lower right, it tells you where to put the transducer and where to angle, and what the picture should look like. So it's coaching you constantly. Let's take a look at this as it actually happens. Here's an operator trying to get a long axis. And finally, when it gets it, it says, hold it for recording, and then it records it. And it tells you all the tools you need to know. Look, it'll tell you angulation and a variety of things. So out of it, if you can get a short axis. And this has been tested in many places, many things, many papers on this now. And in fact, during the pandemic, we use this to give to individuals totally inexperienced in ECHO in our intensive care units. So we didn't have to send anybody with our big machines in. Small machines, you could easily clean. This was, this was incredible. And it changed the way we took care of those patients. But what the magic of it is, is the auto ejection fraction. It does a few calculations, but the auto EF is what it is. But look at the views down at the bottom that it requires the long axis, the apical four, and the apical two. And then automatically it tells you the EF. Imagine this use today in oncology clinics, just what's the EF before I give the chemotherapy? Or the evolution of artificial intelligence within an echo machine. Look at the accuracy it said in published data against uh, expert interpreters, LV size, it did very well. Left ventricular function, that's EF, very well. Right ventricular size, these are diameters, very well. Detection, and here we're into diagnosis. Pericardial effusion on the lower right. It thinks for you and gives the diagnosis. You see the evolution of this coming, and every machine's going to have it. Oh, we started out some time ago, 3D jelly beans. You know this one. This is 24 years ago. One of our people, our fellows, our graduate students in engineering, Chikayo Hazama, invented this. This is a long time ago, and look what he did with the blue there at the top near the apex. That was the wall that wasn't moving. 
His tool could tell you what to look at and what to do. But notice, you're looking at the green, not at the echo. Chakai later took this program and invented Google Earth with it. So the origins of some of our artificial things, Google Earth, which is part real and part artificial, stem from this actual program. And we know these comparisons. If you took many different pictures and had one examiner and another examiner evaluate these uh, just by 2D for ejection fraction, you'd get numbers all over the place. This is many individuals that we did at Duke some time ago. And here's what these things look at. Now, if you do them by computer, by 3D, it's almost that the computer acts for you, giving you the jelly bean. And here are the volumes. And on the right, the ejection fraction. 56%, eh, that's about right. We take it and move on. So if you take the same thing and give 3D pictures to an individual and let the computer do it, look what we achieve. Here's one of the other goals of artificial intelligence, and that is reproducibility in your laboratory, in mine, in Petros, in George's. Everyone is going to get the same numbers on the same patient. This is a significant patient care advance, particularly in heart disease that covers a long period of time. How is the patient responding to treatment? Incredible advances when all of these tools are combined. Well, they don't work perfectly. Look at this one. Craziness still exists. And it depends upon us to say, oh, no, 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 that's not acceptable. So we go back, do it again. But it does bring up the concept of this one, which is heart model. Heart model takes several different views here. And look at it, because this is what all this artificial intelligence is doing. It goes automatically from the 3D data set, goes inside the ultrasound machine that's filled with images of left ventricles in this huge library, looks it up and gives you a picture. Look at the ventricle contracting and the atrium enlarging and all the numbers it calculates on the right. But notice what we're looking at. We're not looking at the echo. We're looking at the model of the echo derived through computers and thousands of these left ventricles that it already knows. And then it models it out for us. But those of you that love numbers, here they are. So how far have we come? But now we say, oh, we're doing an echo but we're looking at what isn't real. So what is real? This brings into account humans, that's us. What do we perceive and what do we know? Oh, I take my granddaughter here, Lily. Her brother's taking a picture of it. Let's see what's real and what he does. Get rid of your little sister. <laughs> that's not real. Well, now it takes us to interpret that that's not real. Oh, these concepts that we're trying to get through. We got 2D auto measure now. So other manufacturers said, well, one company's doing all this stuff, lets us enter the market and lets us do automatic things. Some of you have done this and it works pretty well for Doppler measurements. Let's take a look at what the status is of some of these auto measures here from commercial machines. Here's a ventricle. Uh, it's a little difficult shaped, but let's look at the auto measure. First, we're going to measure LV diameter and systole. Oh, no, it isn't even measuring the ventricle. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try the LV diameters in diastole, our standard measurements. Oops. Look at the septal thickness. Look at the diameter of the left ventricle going from the septum all the way to the pericardium. And then the left ventricular wall thickness back here somewhere, it had to look up lots of different things and place them. So we don't know what's real. This is coming from multiple manufacturers and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Look at this one, here's aortic diameter. Well, the diameter may be correct, but it's not in the aorta. Brings up more questions about the evolution of artificial intelligence and what you are now. 
because now you've got to make a decision if it's measuring like that what's the easiest use auto measure report it or just do it yourself now you see the role of what echo is today in artificial intelligence and most people choose b and that is uh, if i've got 10 patients and it does it this crazy one time out of 10 i'm not going to waste my time anymore but behind it all is the evolution and that evolution is taking place and in a part there with you involved checking it don't be fooled by your eyes and what you want to believe I'm going to go to this movie. Look at the baked potato steaming. How did they get it to steam? Wet tampons in a, in a uh, microwave. Stack of pancakes looks great. Car engine oil. Let's look at a McDonald's standard hamburger. Hair dryer to melt the cheese. The lettuce. and a wedge to hold it up. We'll paint it with vegetable oil. It's gonna be up to you to decide what's real. Two more examples. Here's some cereal just with gelatin and paste. Look what's real and the commercial holds up the cereal. Last one, here's dishwasher soap in your beer. Why not? But it's up to you to differentiate what's real. So the message here is a strong message and that is you are involved now, but you won't be. Artificial intelligence will do things now, though, that we can't do. I think this idea of big data, continuous wearable monitoring analytics to predict heart failure. Well, it's not only in, in an image, you just wear a little sensor on the chest, which then radiates a signal through Bluetooth to your phone or your tablet, then to the cloud, and then analytics occur, all sorts of things. Here's the patch, which can be put on a patient's chest, continuous monitoring. And if you look at this graph in the lower right, and you look at the blue in the middle, that's the entire population. Red line at the top here shows you the freedom from heart failure hospitalizations. And the fact is the, the more, and here's the ones with alerts, and how it could change your therapy. If you get an alert from the machine, you certainly want to have more diuretics or whatever the drug is that's used, as opposed to those without an alert. The concept of big data and artificial intelligence, these are now deployed onto patients' chests. There's all sorts of things happening, but it can get weird, really strange, I mean, things can get strange. You can take AI very far. Let's look back. We're going to look back at Spielberg, the movie, Artificial Intelligence. His name is David. I feel it. That's creepy. Oh, so real. <laughs> distant future, in an age of intelligent machines, he is the first robotic child programmed to love and coexist as a member of a family. Oh, my word. Oh, no. Well, I must say, if we had children that we could control, that'd be really great. But the point, in fact, here, you see the evolution that will ultimately imitate humanity. Whether it will go beyond this original principle by Leibniz we talked about earlier, that's another story. All sorts of books published in the past two years. Artificial intelligence in medicine, AI, how do machines learn? How do they do this? One publication on the right here by our friend Eric Topol at Deep Medicine, 
lots of conclusions to be made, but let's see if we can do some summary here. Lessons for the echocardiography, improve productivity. Yes, faster, diagnosis. We'll be able to report an echo even without us. Scary. Reproducibility, yes, that is important. Free doctors to listen to patients. We already have software at Duke that we just turn it on. It listens as we talk to patients and writes the hospital notes. Reduce the costs, make everything faster. Make a diagnosis, scary. Prescribe treatment, reduce errors, that's good. But the last one, you may become irrelevant. Ultimately, that will happen. I think today, these tools that are available to, to, to us are a second opinion. I always like a second opinion. If the machine does it, that's fine. If George does it, that's great. If Petro does it, that's great. But talking to somebody else makes us better in quality. FDA has a recent statement, actually a few months ago, on artificial intelligence and learning software. Let's see if we can summarize that. Artificial intelligence, they classify statistical analysis, if-then models, machine learning. Yep, those are the tools we talked about, a little bit different words. But look at how they describe machine then learning down below to design and train software, learn and act on data, do something. And they make a big differentiation down the bottom, whether the machine learning is locked and it cannot be changed or adaptive, it changes over time. Our Food and Drug Administration allows artificial intelligence that's locked. Locked meaning it cannot change. They worry about adaptive, which changes over time. That means that they can't determine what the machine is gonna learn and whether it takes us beyond what we already know. We go back to those original concepts that we talked about in all the movies that we looked at. But someday we will control all these monsters. Hopefully the humans are still in control. Maybe we can be, and if we get there, someday artificial intelligence will be perfect. Remember Donald Trump? Remember last year in the summertime when he came out with his Bible, walked in front of the church as everyone was demonstrating? Let's look at perfection in artificial intelligence. Perfect. Blew up Donald Trump. I appreciate all of your attention. These are very detailed concepts, so I appreciate your attention. It's been a long day. So it's good to end with some dreamy thing like this. Well, George uh, Petros? Joe, that was a great uh, inspirational talk uh, and <laughs> to make us uh, think uh, what is to come and how to, well, hopefully be able to control. Uh, do you th I think that uh, we should always be in control of the artificial intelligence that uh, as you showed, it has been around for some time, but we should be using AI, not AI using us. Uh, how can we do that? Well, we, will see, we shall see. Well, one of the things, Petros, is you've got children. You knew at some time you couldn't control those children. <laughs> I mean, we all are learning to adapt to things we can't control. And so whether this is going to be machines or people, I think in this evolution, we're going to get mixed up, but ultimately it will be to the good. We just need to tell the machines what to do, not the machines telling us, but a second opinion, perfect. Yeah. Uh, I was excited by the overview we did, you did uh, coming through from the Leibniz era uh, to Turing's era. And I think that uh, you should also uh, uh, use a step uh, with uh, Gödel, Gödel's, ah. Gödel's, Gödel's theory about the uh, incompleteness, incompleteness 
of any kind of uh, integrative approach in uh, mathematic theories. I think the, 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 best, uh, the best answer in mathematic terms, uh, which is um, uh, according to Petro's uh, statement that we should take care of the AI, not the AI of us, is the limitations which has been established by Gödel in the theory of mathematics concerning this kind of way of organization theories and practices. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good example. And George, you are the perfect Greek philosopher and mathematician because it really, if you look at this, originates a long time ago with all these concepts of philosophy and mathematics. And uh, I forget who it was that said, if we understand mathematics and philosophy, we will understand the world. So we, we're gonna be called upon to go way back in history and start to think these things through again. Well, uh, thank you, Joe, once again. I don't think that there are any questions from the audience. Uh, I think it will um, take uh, us uh, all uh, quite uh, a long time to keep thinking and maturing <laughs> and start shaping up questions for the next talk. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank you all. Good to see you uh, again. Have a so, good rest of the meeting. Great, great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bye -bye. Looking forward to see you in Facebook.